start. The thing is rolling as we speak. Very good. And I'm going to start off. We're currently on, this is the take we do. It just goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we've got a cameraman and a very mm -hmm. impressive operation here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll begin in five, four, three, two. I've got to make sure my fat stomach, I didn't do too. I, I failed in the first round of the Ann Arbor <laughs> Tennis Tournament this weekend. I'm trying to youth myself during these rather interesting times in my own life. Okay, one, five, four, three, two, one. Hello, my name is James Trost, and this is A2 Insight. Today's guest is Mr. John Hilton, the editor of the Ann Arbor Observer. Mr. Hilton grew up in Marquette, Michigan, and received his Bachelor's of General Studies from the University of Michigan in 1972. Following graduation, excuse me, 74, Following graduation, Mr. Hilton worked for several years at an automobile assembly plant in Wayne, Michigan, but also wanted to be a journalist and writer. And in the late 70s, wrote an article for my turn in Newsweek about the automobile industry, and this got him interested in the industry of journalism. Uh, in the early 80s, Mr. Hilton joined the staff of the then new Ann Arbor Observer. He has been a member of the board of the Carytown Book Festival and a member of the North Central Neighborhood Association in Ann Arbor. Mr. John Hilton, welcome to A2 Insight. Thank you, James. You. Happy to be here. Thank I, you. I appreciate the invitation. You're very welcome. Uh, to begin with, would you please give us a little bit more information about your background growing up and uh, what motivated you to think about journalism as a career? Well, the short answer, of course, is the Ann Arbor Observer itself motivated me to think about journalism. Uh, I grew up in a family uh, that was in the midst of transition. My father was born on a failing ranch in Wyoming, but ended up as an English professor at Northern Michigan University, or Northern Michigan Teachers College, as it was at the time he joined it in the 1950, 1950, 1950. Uh, and so all of us grew up as a very verbal bunch of people. There are five siblings. I have an older sister who's a retired uh, disability advocate, advocacy lawyer, another sister who's retired from a technical job at the Redwood Sciences Lab in Arcata, California, and then a younger sister who's still working at uh, the, oh, heavens, I, I was going to say NEA, but that's not right. Uh, hmm. Well, it's the people who do a lot of funding for research in Bethesda. Anyway. She does a lot of studies of retraining and things like that. And then a younger brother who's in the diplomatic service in uh, Sri Lanka at the moment. Interesting. So I like to say that although I'm the only one who makes a living as a writer, we all use writing pretty intensely or have used writing pretty intensely mm -hmm. in our careers. But I'd always thought, too, that it was a, a mugs game, that uh, everybody writes, everybody feels they can be a writer. There's an overabundance of would-be writers. <laughs> uh, and so I never really thought I wanted to try to you know, play the political side of that game to uh, try to become a professional writer until I saw the Ann Arbor Observer. And I was just so startled uh, with the combination of insight and intimacy, the sense of understanding the processes and caring about the people uh, that the founders, Don and Mary Hunt, had brought to it, that uh, at the point when I was in need of a career change, <laughs> I thought I would really like to write for the Ann Arbor Observer. Hmm. And then I made a mistake of following the advice I was just saying I wouldn't do. I tried to, I thought I would sell a national article to get their attention. Mm -hmm. And I did succeed in that. It took me about a year. But it turned out they were not interested at all because being the hunts, all they cared about was did I have something interesting to say mm -hmm. about the city. Mm -hmm. And as it happened, I had been in one of the ICC co-ops here with a guy named Leslie Eric Bohm. He's since passed on, sadly, who had even then had a treadle-operated sewing machine in one of the ground floor rooms under this beautiful oak that I think actually may predate the city. It's a beautiful oak. It's one of the best trees in the city. And uh, I still actually have a handmade belt bag with a little sticker in it saying, you know, hand stitched in saying, handmade by Leslie Eric Bohm. And Leslie had teamed up with an engineer named Sean Jackson to create a line of bicycle luggage. Hmm. And they were uh, out there on the west side of town off Jackson Road on Jackson Plaza. And making this bike luggage. And I thought, well, maybe I can talk to them. 
And so I told the Hunts I was interested. They said, fine. I wrote the story. And uh, that was my first freelance assignment for The Observer. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, at just the right time, <laughs> mm -hmm. Don offered me a job. I had been at the, at, uh, the Wayne Assembly Plant for six years at that point. Uh, and I was the low man in seniority. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a situation where union seniority is critical. <clears throat> but there was nobody with less seniority than me, no one hired after I had been hired, that was still working. <laughs> I had already been pushed off the, my nice job in the trim shop to a, really, a job that I could barely do in chassis. Uh, and I was literally the next person to be laid off. And at that point, taking a two-thirds pay cut to work for the Observer, it sounded like a great plan. And it was. So that's how that happened. So when you, the Hunts who founded the magazine in 1976, I believe. Mm -hmm. or, that's correct. Uh, it was a husband and wife team that started this unique contribution to the community, which has been around now for literally 41 yep. years. Yep, 40 years last year. What, what was your, I mean, they hired you and you had written one article about mm -hmm. a, a bicycle leather uh, bicycle manufacturer, luggage, yep. Yep. luggage manufacturer. What was the position that you were hired for? I was hired as a staff writer in 1982. Uh, I originally was told that I would be helping Mary with the Marketplace Changes column. Uh, that had not turned out to be the real plan. The real plan was that I was taking it over for Mary. But I, I was a couple months in before I knew that, so I had, had a chance to sort of get up to speed on it working with her. And so I wrote the Marketplace Changes column and I wrote a regular business column called Ann Arbor Business, what we call the Business Updates. Uh, and I wrote feature articles. So I'd do about four features a year. I'd do a, you know, one or two business update stories every year, and I'd do you know, six, eight, ten marketplace changes stories every, sorry, every month. Uh, so it was a very productive time. I would think. Look at this. Well, during those years, The Observer was distributed. It uh, still is distributed, actually, to 60,000 permanent residents mm -hmm. of Ann Arbor through the mail. They receive it. You also mm -hmm. have some subscriptions, and you can find this publication at a variety of well, what I've seen, convenience stores and various, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an interesting, and I want to go more into the market and how you, how you promote your program, and of course you've survived where other publications haven't, but how do you decide where everyone who is a permanent resident receives one in the mm -hmm. mail, and you charge $2 a copy at mm -hmm. other locations? At retail, yep. How do you decide which places to place the observer at the beginning of each month? Well, as you said, the great majority of them are delivered directly to people's homes by the Postal Service. We had, had been working with a delivery service and had been having some disturbing reports about how people were finding bundles of observers in dumpsters. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did an audit and discovered that, yes, indeed, some people were disposing of those observers in dumpsters. So we thought, let's go with the Postal Service. And I know it's unusual, but let me put in a plug for the Postal Service. They have been very reliable. They've done a good job for us. <laughs> uh, you know, they cost a little more, but they're worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in terms of the retail distribution, uh, actually of all places, the People's Food Co-op is one of our major outlets. Uh, Nicholas Books near our office over on the west side is a major outlet. Uh, I actually saw it at Whole Foods. Uh, they had, that's an, one way to, for a national chain to get a local presence <laughs> is to put a stand of, stand of observers up front. Uh, so it's a little bit of everywhere. You know, we've had it, we have it in Bush's stores and Meyer's stores. I, in fact, I see it at the Kroger store near my office on Maple. Um, but the great majority of it goes directly to our readers. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we say permanent residents, essentially what we're trying to do is say, we understand that there's a university community with its own population and its own interests, and we're really not focused on that. We do speak to many people who work at the university, obviously, uh, and there are people who live off campus, but we have what we call the white hole around central campus, mm -hmm. uh, and that's an area where we distribute only by request. In other places, we distribute unless we're asked not to. Uh, and then there's a small stretch around North Campus, too, that's similarly where we don't deliver except by request. Uh, but everybody else uh, in the Ann Arbor School District or the Ann Arbor zip codes, we send an issue to. Hmm. Well, that certainly has to be quite an expense, <laughs> not only for production costs, but also for the mailing costs. And it's so a on. substantial one, yeah. And uh, as you said, you know, there were hard times in 08 and 09, and everybody was saying that we would be gone in a year or certainly in five. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we saw the gyrations that the Ann Arbor News went through, which was quite astounding. The discontinuation of the publication as, a, as the Ann Arbor News, the rebranding as if it were primarily a website, annarbor.com, with a sort of secondary uh, newspaper following behind. And we, di we didn't understand that model. You know, we've been online 
for half of our existence. We've been online since 1996. Mm -hmm. And we have never seen a solid revenue model there. Uh, and they seem to think that they had one, but it turned out they didn't. And they essentially fell back to the same situation that they'd been in prior to the uh, creation of Ann Arbor.com, where they have a newspaper, now bi-weekly instead of daily, called the Ann Arbor News, and then a statewide website called MLive.com. And so that was a five-year experiment, and I, you know, heaven knows what it cost them. But it only confirmed our sense that it's very difficult to support editorial uh, uh, with online ad revenue. You know, it's, what I tell people is that we've been online since 1996, and we've never had a month where our online ad revenue has exceeded $1,000, mm -hmm. and never had a month in that same time where our print revenue has been less than $100,000. Mm -hmm. And that includes that period during the Great Recession. Sure. Uh, now, it was very painful for us, very more painful for some of our employees, because we had to shrink our staff. Mm -hmm. We dropped a little over 30% in less than two years in terms of our ad revenue just because people were unable to advertise, they were broke, or they were simply out of business. Uh, in fact, our printer actually uh, liquidated during that period because they had this huge decline in advertising. Uh, and so we, you know, we shrank our staff by five people. One had one open space and then three people we actually had, to, uh, four people we had to lay off. Uh, and we were, our plan was to make that the only cut we would have to do uh, Patricia and I took uh, uh, one-third pay cuts, each of us, and then everybody who's making more than 40000 took a 10% pay cut. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got through it. Uh, we, you know, it bottomed out. Uh, it turned out it was not the end of print. It was not the end of reading. Uh, and we came through it. We saw some recovery. We've recovered. We're probably down about net, about 25% from our pre-recession total, but we're staffed appropriately. Mm -hmm. We print the size that our advertising will support. Uh, and, you know, uh, we were able to make a profit-sharing distribution into our 401k last year, mm. you know, which is our test for success. You know, that's basically the, what we tell our staff is, you know, we'll pay you as well as we can, and if there's a profit, we will share it, and that's how we share it. So, uh, you know, it's hard to say whether, you know, the next five years or ten years, it, you know, that will be steam. But for now, it's a wonderful business, and we still have an opportunity here. And, you know, we've also finally found what looks like an actual online revenue opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't something I've talked to you about before, but uh, just let me take just one minute sure. on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we were approached last summer by the publishers of Traverse Magazine up in Traverse City. And what they had done during the recession, which was interesting, was they had developed a local ticketing site, in, a sense, in essence a Traverse City version of Ticketmaster, mm -hmm. where they invited people who were putting on you know, show, music shows, plays, uh, fundraisers in that area to use their website to, uh, as the place where their customers bought tickets. Mm. And of course that had the advantage for them of tying into what they were already doing with their calendars to mm -hmm. share the news about all these events. But it also had the advantage of bringing in revenue that previously had not been, had been leaving the community to Ticketmaster or brown paper tickets or wherever. Uh, and by last summer, they were ready to start sharing this with other regional publishers. And they came to us and said, would you like to do this? And so literally just this past week, we had an event out at Washtenaw Community College where we invited a number of event producers out to announce that we're going to be launching a site for local ticketing. So we have some hope that that will help sustain it because, you know, while I love uh, the articles that we do, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, by far the biggest part of my editorial budget uh, is basically keeping everybody informed of what's happening in town through our calendar. Sure. You know, I've got two people full time just doing that calendar. Well, and that's certainly a very invalu invaluable resource, and one of the main reasons that people do love the uh, your more than in depth understanding and reading of what's going on in this community is certainly unparalleled. The other th one thing I find also fascinating about that, and maybe you can enlighten us, having such an interesting view of not only Ann Arbor and the community from what you observe no pun intended, uh, but you also have, you, I'd like to, you to just give us a little bit of sense of what's the benefits of a monthly publication as opposed to a daily or even a weekly publication when the negatives associated with in terms of what you can provide. Granted, it's impressive in terms of the advertising and the community focus, mm -hmm. but you consider, and certainly those that love to read your features, you're providing hopefully a valuable service to the community. What is the advantage of being a monthly magazine and the disadvantage? Sure. From your perspective as the yep. editor of the publication. Well, the, the advantage, of course, 
<laughs> is that I only have one deadline a month. <laughs> but the, the other advantage, too, is that we have a clear role. Uh, we're rarely going to be the first with local news. Uh, what we can offer is more thoughtful uh, study about the issue, a deeper perspective, more context. Uh, I was just meeting with Jim Leonard this morning to talk about our coverage for the August primary, for example. Hmm. And there will be things happening in that story even after we go to press with a story that will be published in August. But there are aspects of it that uh, we're able to, I think, give people a deeper understanding of what it signifies, how, it, how we came to this point, where because in some ways it's an important turning point because this is the first election uh, for three-year terms right. because they're going to be phasing out the three-year terms, the two-year terms, and going to standard four-year terms. So the three-year term will then cycle up with an even-year election in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and then next year, they'll have people elected for four-year terms from 2018 to 2022. Uh, and that's going to have a real change in, uh, in terms of how, what kinds of candidates are able to run successfully. Uh, and it's a culmination of a series of changes in the electoral process that have been going on since the uh, early 1990s, from, uh, from both parties, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're going to try to explain some of that to give it context so people can see why the last odd year election is actually an important milestone, uh, quite aside from the fact that the people elected there will be determining what happens to the city going forward. Interesting. Do you feel that with the demise, not only here but certainly nationally, of the daily newspaper, mm -hmm. particularly as it relates to what you were talking about in terms of politics, Who's minding the politicians? There's, who's doing the beat? Who's mm -hmm. checking out for corruption? I'm, are we losing that? Is, is there something, do we as a society lose by not having journalists actively looking for some of the horrors that are still probably out there? We, would, we certainly do when that does not happen. I've got to stop here, though, and put in a plug for the revived Ann Arbor News, and specifically for Ryan Stanton, who's their political reporter. Uh, Ryan is doing the best political coverage I have ever seen in the Ann Arbor News. Uh, and I believe, you know, I'd have to go back and do a study, you know, inch by inch, but I would say it's more abundant, in fact, than it has traditionally been. Uh, so the quality of their reporting uh, and their willingness to use print to share it uh, is, I, you know, it's beyond reproach. Uh, I think very highly of the work that they're doing. You know, they have, now they have, suffered more than we have because they had something we never had. They had classified ads. And that was always the secret of the daily newspaper business, was that those highly profitable classifieds paid for a lot of reporters. Uh, I was just talking to someone the other day who was estimating that there might be one-tenth as many reporters at the Ann Arbor News as there were in the year 2000. Uh, I don't know that it's, that, that it's at that level, but it is certainly radically, radically reduced. Uh, and you know, there's really no longer even any local editorial management. But they have good beat reporters who are doing good work. So we're not in that situation here. It, would it be great to have the, the paper that we once had? Yes. Uh, but I don't want to make it seem that it's the observer or nothing. Sure. Well, I, I can certainly, I, I, just as a personal note here, I, my first job in college was working in the classified advertising ah. department at the St. Paul Pioneer Press uh -huh. due to my typing skills, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Two lines, seven days, $14. Uh-huh. And when I look back at that and think of how much revenue these ads brought in, that was what supported mm -hmm. journalists. And that was long before Craigslist yeah. came over and destroyed yeah. the entire business model for those They things. did, yeah. But going back to the Observer, and, and as I said, you've been there now since the early 80s. Uh, you, the original founders decided to move on, and you mm -hmm. and your wife decided to purchase my business partner. Okay. It's, it's confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, but Patricia Garcia is the publisher and my business partner. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, she does like to joke that it's an arranged marriage. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was the Hunt's idea that ah, Patricia, okay. who was the assistant publisher, mm -hmm. and I, who was uh, a staff writer, mm -hmm. should become the purchasers of The Observer. And so that, that joke may very well have <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, but, it's okay. Excuse but me. just to further confuse things, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just coming up on my fourth anniversary of being married to a staff writer at The Observer, Eve Silberman. So okay. Eve and I have been colleagues at The Observer since 1984, uh, and we have been husband and wife now since 2013. Okay, so the confusion, so Patricia is your business partner, Correct. Eve is your wife, forgive me Correct. for not uh, delving that, but there must be some kind of a, somewhere <laughs> that's, that's, I 
garnered that from some of my research. Uh, let's go back to specifically this, what you believe have been some of the greatest stories that you have somehow been able to give to our community over the past 30, 40 years that you're most proud of in terms of your work with the web server. Well, you know, I, I gotta admit that you gave me a heads up that this was going to be something you were going to ask me. Mm -hmm. And I came up with a few stories right off the top of my head and then I realized that, you know, literally there have been probably 500 feature articles and, mm -hmm. you know, easily 10,000 smaller ones. Uh, and at least hundreds of writers. So, <laughs> having, I'm going to tell you the three that came to my mm -hmm. mind and then say mm -hmm. that it's, it's not fair mm -hmm. that uh, I'm leaving off so many. But uh, one of the first ones that came to mind actually was by, uh, it was one of the first articles I edited actually by a, a great guy named Scott Sugar who's since passed on himself. But it was called My Semester in PE 402. <laughs> and he was a young, trim Navy vet who could pass for an athlete, and so he did. He just walked into a 400-level physical education class at the university, and it was a revelation, just as you might expect. Uh, you know, the, the, the detail that I didn't go back to read it, but the detail that I found most telling was that he did his final project the night before it was due and got an A. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was, that was a great one, and of course the university, oh, blah, 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 you know, we've investigated, we think it's just fine. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, there was a, another one uh, by a woman named Joanne Higashi uh, in the early 1990s that I called Moving Mount Overfill. And that was the point when the city still operated its own landfill. As an old Ann Arborite, you'll remember the landfill mm -hmm, sure. down where the dog park is now. <laughs> mm -hmm. my, my bike, my original bike got crushed by a, a machine back there in 19, an old Kent bicycle was crushed in the back of a, <laughs> was cr crushed in the back of one of those uh, dump truck. Uh -huh. I saw it. It was a traumatic experience as it was screeching as the metal was being crushed. I should think it was. Now, how did, <laughs> was this your parents' decision at, over your head, or was it an accident? Or? Well, actually, it was. When it, it was a hand-me-down bike. I was. Mm -hmm. the, I'm the youngest of five, and it was had this was a Kent. It was a green Kent bike, and it had these unfortunate tires that we couldn't find any new inner tubes oh. for it. So when it went down, oh. it had to go the way of, mm -hmm. of, of all being, steel. End up in that. But I remember that landfill specifically. Uh -huh. so. Well, <laughs> in any case, the city had a landfill. Mm -hmm. And the city actually at that point, it's another, another lost in memory, but uh, the city was actually dreaming that they were going to make their fortunes selling landfill space. Oh, wow. They were trying to open a new cell in their landfill. Mm. Uh, and meantime, they hadn't gotten approval out of it, and they were running out of space. Uh, and so they had simply overfilled beyond their permit levels there. And the DNR came down on them with both feet. And it was, well, how did this happen? You know, why did they overfill if the DNR is going to come down on them like this? You know, what were they thinking? And the answer was, well, in the past, they'd gotten away with this <laughs> between their cells. And the DNR had toughened up. Uh, and so it was a very good story in the sense that it both ex you know, ex explained what went wrong specifically and the context in which that mistake had been made. Uh, and a small world. In that article, I first learned to pronounce the name of Adrian Iraola, who was in that time in charge of the landfill and is now my neighbor running Chela's, <laughs> the Mexican restaurant down the block where <laughs> we get dinner regularly. <laughs> uh, so that was a favorite. And then another from that period was, of all things, from our marketplace changes column, you know, the, the, our retail and restaurant uh, changes column that I worked on earlier on. And it was Lois Kane. And I remember vividly, she was doing a story on the closing of a small motorcycle sales and repair shop down behind the Fleetwood Diner. Oh, gosh. Uh, mm -hmm. And she called me up and said, did you know? Did you know? <laughs> and I said, did I know what? She said, he's not Indian. He's <laughs> African American. <laughs> and India motorcycle sales had been run by a gentleman gosh. who called himself Mr. Muhammad, uh, who mm -hmm. had a, a long backstory that he told people about being sent here from India as a boy. Uh, and his you know, fought deep fondness for the BSA motorcycle, a British motorcycle, because, of course, as a, someone who grew up in the Commonwealth, he was uh, affiliated with it. But it turned out, and this tells you something about the history of Ann Arbor, the earlier history, mm -hmm. that he found it, this was an African-American man from Tennessee who found it more opportune in Ann Arbor when he got here in the 50s to be Indian rather than African-American. Huh. And so he had created this whole persona. And, you know, we'd all accepted that that was who he was. Yeah. Uh, and so, anyway, that was just uh, the hidden life because she actually, you know, she found relatives of his who had come forward and it was just, you know, how he, the, the fascinating glimpse of 
you know, racial relations in Ann Arbor and the choices people made in those situations. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that was, that was one that I was delighted by. But I, I was going to say, too, that in many ways, I'm really happiest with what we're doing right now. Uh, you know, there's an article in the new issue about something that I had not been aware of at all. You know, I'm sure also as an Ann Arbor person, you know of uh, a history of people driving faster than they should on Huron River Drive between Ann Arbor and Dexter. Mm -hmm. And, that, and you know, at some point, the, the city and county cracked down and made that an, a 35 mile an hour zone for the safety of the bicyclists and the pedestrians who use it. But it turns out that that phenomenon of reckless youth now has an accelerant being poured onto it. There are websites devoted to video footage of yourself driving extremely unsafe speeds on open public roads. And there was a guy Excuse who- me, There's a website for people to film their- there, there, there's a, It's actually a YouTube channel. There are multiple YouTube channels, in fact, where people post videos of themselves driving, well, in this case, this guy had driven, had posted a photo of himself driving 90 miles an hour on Huron River Drive uh, last year. And then oh, this year, gosh. he was driving what uh, a local automotive editor estimates was more than 100 miles an hour, and he left the road and hit a tree. Mm. And uh, you know, it, the, as the editor said, you know, it's a testimonial to the car that they survived. Mm. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a behavior that's now being fed mm. by uh, social media. Wow. So that was a revelation to me. Well, we see technology changes. The idea that you know, I was when I was a kid, I, the, the, we were always told that the here on Parkway near the golf course was a speed trap. Mm -hmm. Sir, never would have envisioned the possibility that you'd be out there filming your own yeah. illegal activities for uh, public yeah. consumption. Well, that, that's that's of course here on Parkway. This is here on River Drive uh, between Ann Arbor and Dexter, out west. Right, yeah. which is a little bit less. Yeah. Of, you know, now, of course, it's the deer. That, the other thing. It's the deer that make it a speed trap now. <laughs> <laughs> True, but well, with these changes, I'm of course, you've drive. you've seen you've seen a lot in that, and I would hope that, given the fact that you seem to have, and certainly are thriving in terms of seeing the the quantity of advertising, mm -hmm. although I'm, it's not the way it used to. And no. What do you honestly see as, and I would consider your publication a niche publication, mm -hmm. and there are several papers in the area that, particularly local newspapers, that are mm -hmm. doing well, and mm -hmm. we do see the, the growth and the strength of the internet and everything mm -hmm. related to it. Where do you see the Ann Arbor Observer? Mm -hmm. uh, do you see you with it in five to ten years as its editor, or do you see the publication evolving in a way that you would hope to see in uh -huh. the coming years? Well, we do hope to find some additional sources of revenue, obviously, uh, so we can sustain some of the editorial things we do that are, uh, you know, that, we, for example, the calendar also had to shrink substantially. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did some rearranging there that has made it, you know, so they were able to cram more information into the same space. But it does mean that you have to read uh, through the whole first week of the month for the repeating events, for something that happens every Tuesday, for example. We now list only on the first Tuesday and then say, you know, other Tuesdays people have to a trust to go back and look. Uh, so I, we're hopeful that we'll find that. Uh, we do have a, a, a sound business model, which simply says that we'll do the best publication we can with the advertising we sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I'm still at a loss for why that wasn't true for the Ann Arbor News as well. Uh, you know, it, it just seems like if you, if you have a commitment to the work, which is you know, explaining the community to itself, letting people understand the people and the processes that brought us here and that are taking us forward, uh, it's, you, you can find a way to do it. Uh, you know, it, as I said, it was a very painful time in 08 and 09, but we found a way to do it, and you know, extraordinarily, what we did that one time has worked ever since. Uh, it has been, you know, it, it's been a real, you know, delight to discover that people who said that print would be gone in a year or five years were wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's at some point it's going to continue to decline, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, there's there's nothing like it. We just got the Ann Arbor News circulation numbers for our city guide yesterday, and they're down to 17,000 on Thursdays, and I think 23 on Sundays. And you know, I remember when they were 75. Um, so there's definitely uh, you know, a need for what we're doing, and we try to do it as well as we can in the space that our advertisers give us. Well, on behalf of the community, I'd like to say we don't want to lose you as a gem. The Observer is a magnificent and an invaluable resource, given the changing times and demographics. We certainly hope that you will be leading the organization, hopefully for a long time to come, and that you're able to continue to adapt to the interesting challenges, I suppose mm -hmm. would be a good way to put towards your, particularly the industry of print media. 
So on behalf of A2 Insight, my name is James Chose. I'd like to thank you once again, Mr. Hilton, for joining us today. Until next time.